All right. Welcome to another episode of the Placing People First podcast. Before we meet today's guest, let's give a shout out to our sponsor, Bridging the Gap Recruitment. BTG offers recruiting and executive search services. Their team of recruiters have decades of experience with thousands of placements. They're always recruiting. If you're an employer, they may have qualified candidates ready for placement. And if you're looking for a position, make sure to send them your resume as they will actively market you to potential companies. They also offer a seven-day guarantee. They guarantee to have a qualified candidate to you in seven days or you save 50% of the placement fee. You can learn more about them at bridgingthegapus.com. And with that, let's jump straight into today's guest. Uh, Melissa, tell us who you are and what you do. Hey, I am Melissa Dinwiddie. My company is Creative Sandbox Solutions. It's a learning and development consultancy, and we specialize in working with fast growing people first tech teams and organizations and transforming them into a culture of creativity so their impact matches their smarts. We do team development, leadership development, kinds of um, of uh, engagements. And our, our differentiator is that we do this through play so that everything we do is everybody is having a blast while we do it. So we do things like um, building out uh, a, a deep bench of leaders and uh, uh, creating like a dream team that everybody is, is, is looking for and all using play. So that is what I do. Love it. And I love how unique your approach is. And before we jump into kind of the who, what, the why, and how you're doing what you're doing, I want to talk a little bit about your story because you have a unique journey on kind of how you got here. So give us some of your background. How'd you end up doing what you're doing? Yeah, well, I sometimes refer to my my career path as being a little bit like a, a ball in a pinball machine because I've kind of been a little bit all over the place. I actually started out as an artist. I don't come from a corporate background at all. I had a business as an artist, mostly doing work on commission involving calligraphy and illustration. I did a lot of marriage documents. There's a document called a ketubah that is part of every Jewish wedding ceremony. And I made a lot of these by hand on big sheets of paper with lots of lettering. And then I uh, developed a line of prints where people could go up on my website and they could pick a design and pick a text, depending on the, the kind of rabbi who was officiating at the ceremony and built out this entire business with all kinds of systems and processes and everything except that I was the only person in the business. So it was actually a very, um, a, a big job that I had built for myself rather than, you know, a business. And I got very burned out doing this. And in 2010, I basically decided to, <laughs> to switch gears and uh, I started a blog. I realized that I was not here. I was, I had built up this business as an artist, which is kind of, you know, you would think it's every artist's dream. It's like the Holy grail, right. To, to make your living as an artist, except that I was living the most uncreative life possible as an artist. And I started a blog called living a creative life. And I realized I was not doing that. I wasn't living a creative life. And I really wanted to figure out how to live a creative life. And I started interviewing people who were making their livings as artists and creatives and recording those interviews. A lot of people were doing this back then. We're recording recording interviews and sort of packaging them up into information products. And uh, I had been sort of collecting followers to my blog and I offered this package of interviews along with a membership site and some marketing lessons together. I called it the Thriving Artist Project. And lo and behold, something like 37% of my tiny mailing list actually purchased this Thriving Artist Project. And I thought, well, okay, I'll just keep throwing spaghetti at a wall and see, see what I can do here. And so I I made more online courses and kept going at this. And uh, one of my followers called me a creativity instigator and that label stuck. And I still call myself that to this day. Although uh, back in 
um, 17, I guess it was, I realized I was leading an in-person creativity retreat. And I realized that what I was doing at that moment, holding space for people at, in a, in a uh, setting that really is, is my genius zone. And I thought, well, what, what, what was I doing building this, this online business of doing these, you know, e-courses, I really should be working with teams and groups. And so that is a big part of what led me to pivot and create my consultancy to work with organizations in, um, you know, in group settings. And that's what led to my uh, for, founding my consultancy. But in the meantime, here I had been helping create, you know, creative folks, artists and makers and creatives get creatively unstuck because I had figured out through my own experience of getting creatively blocked, I had to get back to making art for myself. And I had figured out that Devin, after you know, building up this business as an artist and getting so creatively blocked, I had to get back to it. And I had had this epiphany that what I needed was to get back to play. I needed to get back to that place of being a four-year-old kid. You know, four-year-old kids, little kids, they don't care what anybody else thinks about what they make. They don't care about, you know, making money from what they make. They don't care about impressing anybody. They don't care about winning any awards. All they care about is, look, there's a crayon or there's a bucket of sand or there's some water. Let's see what we can do with it. Isn't this fun? They're just immersed in the process and experimenting and playing and making messes. And I knew that that's what I needed in order to get back to the joy of creating and the joy of creativity. And so in order to get there, in order to get back to that inner four-year-old mindset, I had to create some rules for myself because I'm an adult. So I established a set of rules, which over a period of years grew out to 10, I now call them guideposts. And I actually have them here. They started off as a little, I, I actually made a little e-course and eventually it turned into my book, The Creative Sandbox Ways. So the 10 guideposts form the backbone of my book. And the reason that it's called The Creative Sandbox Way is I was looking at a piece of art that I had made and I made a series of artworks that were, um, these these sort of brush stroke women made out of composed of a um, just a few brush strokes very simple very clean combined with some words of calligraphy and I some of them were were women in yoga poses and I had a lot of fun doing these the the series for a few weeks but after a while I, I I started avoiding my art table again I couldn't figure out why and one day I was looking at the pieces that were sitting on my art table and it hit me these pieces that I had had so much fun with originally were exactly like the work that I had been doing for clients. I would do 50 identical brush strokes. I would pick the best one, scan it into Photoshop, and then manipulate it. And then I would do 50 more identical brush strokes, scan, pick the best one of those, scan that into Photoshop, combine it with the previous one, Everything was so meticulous and so perfectionistic. It wasn't what my inner child needed. My creative spirit needed to make messes and play and experiment. And I wasn't letting her do that. I needed to be like a little kid playing in a sandbox. And it really, Devin, it was like this light bulb went off over my head. And that was when the metaphor of the creative sandbox was born. And ever since that metaphor has been like my whole life has been led from that metaphor. It's been like the foundational principle of my life and my business. And that's why the book, that's why I called my book, the creative sandbox way. And that's why my business now is called creative sandbox solutions. So that's the story, Devin. I love it. And I love, 
I love when people have a journey that's unexpected, but all of it builds to where you are today in a meaningful and deep way, right? And I think that's what I want people to understand about the work you're doing is it's not just, hey, I had an idea and I just ran with it. It's like, no, I went through a journey and I identified a need and I tested and I experimented and figured out like what works for me and how do I apply that in a relatable way? And how do I strategize and create a system around it, right? Which you've done now too. And so I love that you explain how you you kind of just were flowing and flowing and then figured out who you are, who you want to serve and how you want to serve them. Because do you want to be online? Do you want to be in person? Like those are all things that matter. So I appreciate the story and I appreciate you kind of telling us where you're at. So let's talk about referencing your books. You mentioned, you know, 10 guideposts. So maybe maybe give us a quick highlight of, you know, what are some of the areas that that the book covers? Yeah, so, well, I can share some of the guideposts. I actually turn them into a song. I won't, I won't necessarily share the, the whole song right now, but uh, the first guidepost is there is no wrong. Number one, there is no wrong. Now, obviously, if you're a brain surgeon, there is wrong. But when you're talking about creativity, when you're talking about generating ideas, when you're talking about anything artistic or If you're trying to come up with new ideas in a business context, it's the same thing. You have to allow space for generative thinking, for uh, divergent thinking, for, you know, if you're in a brainstorming session or an ideation session, if you're trying to innovate, you have to allow space for people to try things, right? There is no wrong has to be a guiding principle. So that's guidepost number one. There is no wrong. Guidepost number two is think process, not product. So often we get so caught up in the idea that our output, the outcome of whatever we're creating as an artist, as a business person, that output has to be good, right? It has to be great. It has to impress people. It has to make money. It has to, you know, win an award or something like that. And what happens when we do that? We choke. That is not going to end up with our best output. It's so ironic. But what we have to do is really focus on the process, the experience of creating whatever the thing is, which leads right into guidepost number three, which again, seems very ironic, but is think quantity, not quality. Now, there are situations in life where you want to be thinking the opposite. You want to be focused on the quality, but when it comes to creativity, we want to be focused on the quantity how, what, you know, why, how, how, how can this make, make sense? Well, if you've ever had photographs taken, think about, you know, if you've ever had wedding photographs, if you've ever had headshots taken, you don't have the photographer come and take two photos and expect that both of those photos are going to be great. No, the photographer takes hundreds of photos. And then from those photos, maybe you get two or three really good photos, of course. That's the concept of think quantity, not quality. You have to generate a lot of ideas in order to get a few really great ideas. That's the concept of think quantity, not quality. So those are the first three guideposts. Love that. So let's let's tie that into people, right? And I think what's interesting is I can see how you're kind of playing on some of these stereotypical sayings in business. Uh, and so I see the play <laughs> because, right, it usually is the opposite in business to a lot of what you just said, but there's so much valid in the play and the creativity. So why is play and creativity important to teams? Why, why is it important to retention? So talk to me about kind of why you're going into businesses and, and what you're, what you're accomplishing and how that impacts our team. Yeah, so much of what I'm doing with with teams in particular, I do with work with teams and I work with with leadership development as well. When I'm going in to work with a team, there's a few things often that are going that are going on. Often I'm brought in because, oh, you know, we're doing um uh, uh well, here's an example. The the CEO of an energy 
company contacted me recently and they are, because of the pandemic, they were an all in-person organization. And now because of the pandemic, they have become an all remote organization. And they're really been kind of struggling with how to, how to maintain, build and maintain those bonds between people, which used to happen just, you know, people would hang out in the kitchen and they have this little chit chat and things like that. That doesn't happen anymore now that they're all remote. So how do they, how do they manage? And now people are, you know, cross departments, they don't know what's happening. There's a lot of siloing that's going on. So the CEO really to their credit uh, figured out, okay, we, we need to have some kind of way to bring people together since they don't know how to do this effectively. There are ways to do this effectively remotely, but they haven't figured out that out on their own. So they already figured out, well, let's do some kind of in-person gathering to, you know, create some kind of bonding, which is great. That's a really great start. And what I suggested is if you bring me in, it doesn't have to be me, but somebody like me, come in and have some kind of continuity. I can get to know your organization and, and I can come in and work with you on a regular basis, be it quarterly, every two months, every month. And we can have those bonding, connecting experiences. But here's the key, Devin. It's not just to get together and have a recess, which is often what a lot of other companies that do, you know, corporate team building events do. It's just, you know, a recess where yes, people bond and they connect. But what I also do is I will through the play activities, work on real business challenges through the play activities. And then also use this, my strategic advising to help them create a continuity experience in their remote experiences in between, whether it's, you know, on and their in-person experiences that they are creating in between, whether they're creating, you know, book groups or basketball games or whatever they're creating, I will help them strategize to create in-person experiences together and, and remote experiences together, scavenger hunts on Slack, whatever it might be that works for their culture. And in the in-person experiences that we have at whatever cadence we determine is, is you know correct for them, I will come in and let me give you an example of a, of a play-based activity that solves a real world business challenge. So here's an example Here's something that I did with uh, a high-level research team at Stanford, uh, not Stanford, at, um, at Facebook. So they have uh, a team that uh, has a high level of expertise and uh, is trained as academics. They're trained to really argue their point. They're not really trained in, shall we say, diplomacy skills, right? And, and their expertise is so high that they really suffer from that sort of curse of expertise where it's hard for them to explain the complex uh, information that they're trying to communicate to somebody else in a way that other people can understand it. So my task is to help them learn how to communicate to different audiences. When they're trying to communicate to somebody else with the same level of expertise, it's not a problem because they can talk in jargon and other people can understand that jargon. But when they're trying to talk to their cross-functional teammates, their cross-functional teammates don't understand that jargon. So it's like they're speaking Greek to somebody who only speaks German. It doesn't make any sense to them. So a game that I might play with them, I may not call it a game to them, but it might feel like a game to them is I'll split them up into pairs. And one person in the pair is from the present time, everything's normal for them. The other person in the pair is a time traveler from 500 years ago. And I asked them to really embrace that character from 500 years ago. So first, as a group, we, we discuss like, what does that mean? What would life, what's life like for that person from 500 years ago? What is different for them? So Devin, let me ask you, what, what 
would be different for somebody from 500 years ago. Well, I, yeah, I love that because it's simplicity for sure, right? So there's not, technology doesn't exist. Yeah, right, exactly. They would have very different technology. They wouldn't have electricity. They wouldn't have lights. They Maybe they wouldn't even have windows. There, there are a lot of things they wouldn't have, right? So we, we'd, we might spend a, a, you know, a few minutes talking about this and how, what, how things would be different for somebody from 500 years ago. And then I would outline th what the activity is. The person from the present time is gonna hold up their cell phone and they're gonna pretend that they received a call. And their job is to explain this device to the time traveler. But the caveat is, of course, the time traveler is gonna think they're a witch. So the present time person, their job is to explain what the cell phone is to the time traveler without being condemned to burn at the stake. And they only have two minutes to do this. So that's the game. That's the setup. And then we come back and we, I ask, you know, how many witches are there in the room? Who's getting condemned to burn at the stake? And pretty much everybody raises their hand. So then we talk about what worked, what didn't work. And then, you know, we talk about how important it is to have a common point of connection, how helpful it is to use analogies and to, you know, really understand the context of your audience. And then we go back and switch roles. And now usually they do a better job because they've had a little bit of a lesson in what works and what doesn't work. And we come back and we debrief it some more. And I tell you, Devin, this exercise is so impactful for people. We have had, when people come back for the second session, we have had people talk about how they were having a conversation with a cross-functional teammate and just really struggling to explain something and they were getting really frustrated. And then they thought back to this activity and realized, oh my goodness, it's not that this person's being a jerk. It's not that they're stupid. They are like the time traveler and they just have a different context. And it helped them to be able to communicate what they were trying to communicate. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of using play to solve a real, a real world challenge. That's the kind of thing that I do. Well, and I think that's a huge, that's a takeaway already, right? Because if you have a team and you're struggling with, cross department communication or sales communicating to production and fulfillment, which happens all the time, um, or managers communicating with managers because then ego is involved. Um, you know, I think that that example is just one example of, it doesn't have to be a PowerPoint 60 page guide to solve the problem. We can do activities that get them people out of their comfort zone, puts them in a place of play, let them be creative and then have common conversation. And so I love that example. I think people could reference that right now if they're dealing with that in their organization. The other thing you mentioned is the importance of getting together in a non-work environment, right? Whether that is, you know, dedicated time virtually or in-person time. But I think one thing you said that I think people need to pay attention to is, yes, it's important to allocate the time, but make sure there's a plan, right? Let's not just have this like, I know uh, right in the middle of a pandemic, it's like, let's do a happy hour, right? And so everyone will get on and, you know, you have your drink and everyone's on Zoom. And the, the goal is to have like a conversation that's non-business, but without an agenda and like a reasoning, it just becomes this kind of wasted hour where people aren't really engaged. So, you know, have intent with your plan in, in those events. Um, can you talk to us about the virtual world? I know you love to do the in-person stuff and you're amazing at it. Um, but there is so much hybrid. So how, what's an activity we could do to bond uh, with virtual team members or a virtual team? G give us one activity we could test. Yeah, I love that you asked about virtual and that activity that I just shared with you was actually an activity that I developed as part of a virtual training for this high level research team at Facebook. And I have run that particular program, Communicating for Influence. I have run it exclusively virtually for the past, uh, coming on three years now. Um, in terms of uh, virtual activities, one of my favorites actually is 
Um, this is just a really lovely one called True of Me or True for Me. And you can run it a number of different ways. It's just, it's a, a main room activity. Everybody's in the main room of whatever platform you're on, whether it's Zoom or Teams or whatever. And everybody grabs uh, a sticky note or, or you can use an object. You, the goal is you just wanna cover up your webcam. Everybody covers up your webcam. And then whoever's leading it uncovers their webcam and says something that's true for them true of them could be like, I love cats and I have two cats. And if that statement is also true of you, then you uncover your webcam. You can also do this with starting and stopping your video. That's another way to do it. If you do it that way, it's really fun to, uh, on Zoom, you have the option to change your settings to hide non-video participants, which is kind of fun because then the room sort of shrinks or grows depending on how many people have shown have have their videos on or off in any case if i say like i'm a cat person and i have two cats or i have you know have a cat have more than one cat whatever it is then if you know if you're a cat person too and you have a cat or a cat one or more cats go ahead and show your video and then we can you know this is the room full of cat people people who have cats let's give each other our fist bumps yay and then everybody goes ahead and covers their videos again. But first I'm gonna take some, some air and put it into a ball of energy and I'm gonna throw it to somebody else in the room. Devin, you can go ahead and catch the ball. And now we can all cover up our videos again. And then Devin, you can share something that's true for you. So that's a really fun one. And you can do lots of different variations on that. So the one the variation that I just shared is a self-selecting, um, each person, or, you know, you can limit it to like five people or 10 people in the room or whatever, go around the room and each person shares, or as the facilitator, you can just ask a bunch of questions, uncover your video or show yourself if you had coffee this morning. And then everybody who had coffee this morning uncovers their video and then go ahead and cover your video again. Now show yourself if you hate pineapple on pizza, you know, whatever the question is. And you can put together a bunch of questions that are themed to whatever you want them to be themed around. So that's a really lovely one. And it gets people engaged. If you, if you have, you can have them hold up their coffee mug and use their, or whatever they have in front of them, you know, grab something that's at least as big as a coffee mug and use that to cover up your video. And then it gets people moving a little bit and um, gets everybody engaged. So that's always a, a fun one. Such a fun activity. And I could see that we used to do something similar where we would do uh, like cultural story time. <laughs> and it was for commonality, right? Cause I had an international team and I have an international team again. And so it's like, tell us something that's unique about your culture or something that's coming up and then let's find a relatability. And so they would say like, well, you know, this week we're doing X, Y, Z in my hometown. And then everyone would go around and say like, oh, that's so interesting. We have something similar. And they would like tie into it. And I love that idea of creating commonality, especially with big teams, because it allows them to go like, oh, I didn't know that about that person. Now we have common ground. We can have conversation. We could set up time for, you know, a virtual coffee date, whatever it may be to dive deeper into that common conversation. So what a great activity. And I love that it's interactive. I love that you're making people engage, not just, again, digest, right? I think there's so much time when we're just being spoken to. <laughs> and yes. I think we need to engage, right? And that's the power of, you know, group coaching and the power of bringing teams together and then having them participate. So that's such a good highlight. I love that. Talk to me about a success story. So what's one, one example of a team that just is absolutely crushing it? And why is that? Like, why do you see success with that team? You know, I think I'll talk about one of my favorite companies to work with. Although I, 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 was, I was just about to talk about a company and I, they're a little bit shy about being referenced um, publicly. So I probably shouldn't talk about them. Um, well, that's all right. You can give us an example of why they're amazing. You just don't have to reference. Yeah. 
So I loved working for this company. It's a craft company. And I loved working, working for them because they, their values are so human and it, you know, it's all about the people and it, it, you know, as it's, it's so fun to go in as, as a contractor and, you know, to go in as an outsider and to be able to see, you know, the label, you know, I'm not inside the jar. They, I, I think when you're inside the jar, you can't see the label right from inside. And so I have the, the advantage of being able to be, be on the inside, but then also be able to see the label from the outside. And uh, I just loved working with this group because they were so positive, even when we had some high stress moments and they were, they were never, um, you know, we, we had a moment, I'm trying to remember exactly what happened, but there was, uh, oh, oh, I remember <laughs> there was a decision that happened by upper management that dramatically affected, like, we, we were getting pushback from everyone. We were doing these public workshops, and I was brought in to design these public workshops and these these virtual live interactive workshops and make them really scalable and really fun and engaging and, and feel safe for um, people who are using their creativity and were really intimidated. And management at the, it just so happened made this major decision that uh, customers were really ticked off about. And so we were suddenly like, oh my God, should we just shut down the chat? Well, you know, what's going to happen? Are we going to get all this blowback as a result of this? It was incredibly stressful and the whole team and the, the, um, my contact who was in charge of everything, it's like, we had to, we had to change things on the fly and, and figure out like an, an entirely new chat platform. And it was incredibly stressful. And, um, they just were so gracious and graceful and nobody, I mean, I've been in situations where people have been really nasty you know, when those kinds of things have happened and they've taken things out on other people and nobody did that. They just were kind. And, um, you know, everybody was super stressed out, but, but everybody was just very kind to each other and always, uh, you know, asking each other how we can, how we can be creative and, and have each other's back. You know, it was a very improv mindset, actually. I, I come from, I use improv a lot in my work and I come from an improv background and that appeared they, I don't think they were doing that intention, you know, like mindfully that I don't think that was something that they were doing with um, mindful, like thinking about it, but, but that, that improv mindset of having each other's back was very much there. That's a great example. And I love that you referenced that, right? Because the high tense moments and probably the podcast that's right before this, uh, we talked to Helen who wrote a book called love your team. And what's fascinating about your story and what we talked about on her podcast was this com the need for conversations between team members and that you have to have compassion. And she uses the word love intentionally because there needs to be this, this level of caring. And the story you just gave is an exact example of that, right? We're dealt this car hand of cards that's not amazing. And instead of us attacking everybody, we started having conversation and dialogue and really tried to figure out like, how do we pivot to end up with a result that we all can live with and that's aligned for the whole company? And so that's a cool that you referenced that. And then, yeah, I'll plug that podcast because we talk so much on that one about love and communication and what that means in a team environment, which is a great kind of play to what you're talking about because play and creativity goes really well together with that. Yeah, absolutely. That's one of the reasons I'm such a big proponent of improv because that whole mindset of you know, make your partner look amazing. If you make your partner look amazing, if everybody does that, then, you know, you're golden. The whole team is golden. The whole company is golden. That's awesome. Talk to me about, uh, we've given them some tips. We've referenced your book. We've kind of talked about a couple of games and examples and ways to, to further communication. Um, 
as a leader, right? So kind of shifting to the leadership side, as a leader, what are a couple of tips on how to be a better leader? What, what's one or two tips that I could try to test or implement uh, with my team that would make me a better leader? Well, I'm really big on the principles of improv. And, you know, just basically pick, pick up an improv principle, you know, make your partners look amazing. That's a great one. If you can make your team look amazing, they, that's going to make them want to make you look amazing. Everybody's going to be golden. I love that. So let's just use that as a takeaway then. So as a leader, uh, the way that I like to reference that is I love to edify my team. Right. I think edification is a phenomenal tool and people love to be edified. And so when we're in team meetings and environments where we have the chance to edify someone and make them feel amazing, especially in front of other people, like there's so much power there. And so I love that. Like your challenge this week is, is there a way that through improv and through gratification and edification, you can make you, every member of your team stand out? Uh, and if you can do that the next week, the results are going to be phenomenal. Like they'll speak for themselves because your team energy will go up and then you'll get reciprocation there as well. So that's an awesome tip. I love that. So talk to me about your journey. Uh, what's a lesson you would tell your younger self? If you reflect on kind of how you got to where you are, what's something you would tell your younger self? Um, you know, one of the things that I feel like I've been really sort of sinking into lately is allowing myself to be myself and just sort of relaxing into me. And I think that my younger self had a lot of anxiety around, you know, not being enough and I should be that person over there rather than being me. And it, it's taken me longer than I wish it had taken me. <laughs> to allow myself to just be myself. That was the exact answer, not on Helen's podcast, but on another podcast I just recorded. And oh, it, was, really? it was very relatable. And I love that answer because it's so authentic. And it's, it's this thing where like, and I feel like, especially when I say young professionals, that could mean age or it could just mean experience, right? So take that however you want. I feel like we see what we perceive as success or successful, and we try to replicate that, even if it's not fully who we are, whether that's how we dress, whether that's how we talk, whether that's how we show up. Uh, and then we end up in this, this false world <laughs> right, that might be not truly who we are. And so it's interesting. I remember my coach this year that I'm working with, he always talks about how like he just wears t-shirts and he rides bikes to work, doesn't even own a car. And he's like, that's just who I am. And what's crazy is he talks about how he used to be a financial advisor and he decided to be intentional about dressing down in the financial advisory world, which is crazy because he had high net worth clients and he decided, you know what, I, I'm not a suit and tie guy. Like, why do I keep showing up like that? Well, I show up like that because that's what the industry has told me to do versus I'm going to show up how I am. And what he realized is he had more meaningful relationships with his clients and there, it was more comfortable and the people he attracted were more aligned with him. And so there's so much meat in that answer. That's great. I love that. Yeah. I feel like on a daily basis, I kind of need that reminder. And I wish that I had been able to take that in a lot earlier. <laughs> yeah. it's No, it's such an important takeaway. And I think, you know, if you the way to reflect on this, right, and to hear what Melissa just told us is, you know, take a second and think about how you're showing up, right? Think about how you're approaching situations and think about like, is it authentically you? Is it is it the you with without the makeup, the you without the nice clothes, the you who's just at home relaxing? Is that the you or is this the you that you are trying to, to portray? Um, and I'm telling you, the closer aligned to those two become, the more impact you're going to have because people are going to feel that. Um, and so, yeah, and you might have to do it a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I feel like it's kind of um, peeling layers off of an onion, you know, and getting down to that core. That's awesome. 
So I'd love to ask for book recommendations. Obviously, we've highlighted your book. What's another book people should dive into, something that you think is beneficial? I love this question, and I will share a book that um, I recommend all the time, which is The Willpower Instinct by Kelly McGonigal. It's not a new book. It's been out for, oh my gosh, it's probably like five years or more, but this book is so transformational. It's really, it's all about the power of it, willpower, what it is, what it does, why it matters, and it will change your life if you read this book and apply what it's talking about. So Kelly McGonigal is, a, I think she's like an associate professor at Stanford. Anyway, she teaches at the um, at Stanford's continuing education program. And for many years, she had taught this science of willpower course through their continuing education program. And, she, and the course is really cool because she looks at all of these different scientific studies on willpower. And the book is basically the course at, you know, sort of a snapshot of that course at that moment in time. I read the book and then I ended up taking the course which had, you know, some new studies that, you know, the book didn't have. And she actually wanted to call the book, The Science of Willpower, but the people at whatever publishing company, Random House or whatever it was, were like, oh no, no, people are afraid of science. We have to call it something else. So that's why it's called The Willpower Instinct. But it's basically The Science of Willpower. And it's so, it will, it will change your behavior because it's, it's really fascinating. So anyway, I highly recommend it. I have not heard that recommendation. I know we did talk about that when we were meeting offline, but I haven't had that recommendation on a podcast. So definitely we'll put a link to that. Is there anything we haven't talked about that you want to share to add value or just a, a piece of the puzzle that we didn't discuss today? Um, well, you know, I've mentioned improv a lot and I will say that if there's one thing that you can do to improve your life, improve your business, just, you know, change your life for the better is to take a, a good improv class. And I, good is the, 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 the important word here, because if you get a bad improv teacher, it's bad. But if you can find a good improv course, and the problem is you don't know, you know, the difference between a good and a bad one when you're shopping around as a beginner, but somebody who really can establish psychological safety and not set it up as a competition or something like that. Uh, I have a, uh, a colleague and a mentor, Kat Coppett, who refers to improv as the gym for life. You know, you go to a, a gym with weights for your body. Improv is the gym for life. So that's something that I will share for anybody listening, Devin. Appreciate that. How do people connect with you? What's the best way for them if they want to, to talk more or maybe hire you or just get to know you? How should they reach out to you? Yeah, you can reach me on LinkedIn, Melissa Dinwiddie. And you can also reach me at creativesandbox.solutions. And you can also find me at melissadinwiddie.com. Awesome. Well, Melissa, thank you so much for making time for us and diving deep and, and giving us so many takeaways and tools. I love that we have tools that came out of this. I uh, appreciate you making time and I love what you're doing. Thanks so much for having me, Devin. This has been a blast.